Uh, thank you for having me. So, uh, first of all, hi, again, I said that. Uh, my last name is pronounced Swaidan. The all the vowel letters, S-O-U-E-I-D-A-N, uh, that pronunciation, uh, that spelling is uh, more German and French than it is English. So, you know, this is how you pronounce it, Swaidan. I'm a front-end developer with an emphasis on developer because a lot of people tend to sometimes forget that I develop websites for a living. And because of all the writing and speaking that I do, they only think of me as a, as a writer and a speaker. Uh, but then again, I do uh, write a lot. Uh, I used to write a lot about CSS, and I ended up writing a CSS reference for code drops. Uh, in the last two years, I've been focusing more on SVG in particular, and um, I contributed to the last smashing book, number five, which is all about responsive web design with a really long chapter about SVG as well. And I write a lot of SVG articles on my blog, which you can find here. Now, this talk is going to be about SVG, and um, it's not going to be a very technical one. It's going to be more about the process, designer, developer process, because there is a lot of stuff that can help make working with SVG a lot easier for both teams. I'm going to get into uh, to that later. But I I'm hoping that we're already past the why is SVG so great phase. I'm pretty sure that all of you know that SVG is great, right? OK, SVG is awesome. So I'm not going to get into the reasons why it is. But there is one thing that always keeps, whenever I read an article about SVG anywhere, there's always this one comment from this one developer who's like, SVG is so cool. I want to use it, but I still have to support IE8. Well, that's not a problem, even if you do. First of all, browser support for SVG is, is awesome. I mean, look at all that green. You only have IE8 and below and older Android browsers. And for those, I mean, if you're not going to use SVG, you're probably going to be using PNG or JPEG or any other image format, right? So why not use SVG for all of your browsers and then provide fallback for the non-supporting ones? There is a whole bunch of techniques that you can use to provide fallback for non-supporting browsers. Um, there's an article on CSS tricks. Um, the link is here, but I'm going to be sharing it later again. Um, fallback, we have many different ways to embed an SVG. And for each one, we have at least one or multiple ways to provide fallback. So it's not really a problem anymore. Now, the second thing that I always, the second question that I always get is, OK, I'm sold. I want to use SVG. But how do I know when to use it or what to use it for? Um, how do I know if the image that I'm working with is a good candidate for SVG or not? So the second thing that I want to talk about before I get into the process is when to use SVG. Um, SVG is an image format and a document. It's an XML document format. So it can do more than just display images. But if you are going to display an image, if you're not sure how to choose the image format, there is, some, there is a rule of thumb that I always follow. Raster images are the preferred format when creating or working with continuous tone images, such as photographs. I wouldn't use an, the SVG format for those. SVG is the preferred format. Usually, the best candidates for SVG are user interface controls, logos, icons, and vector-based illustrations. And even with this rule of thumb, there's always, there are always exceptions. For example, this image here is the perfect candidate for SVG. It's a vector image. It was created in Illustrator. But when you export this image as SVG and as PNG, for example, because you want to provide fallback in case the SVG is not supported, the SVG weighs 128, 23 kilobytes even after optimizing it, but the PNG weighs 66 kilobytes. Now, this file size, the difference in this file size is not trivial. So in that case, if the file size, I have another example here, for example, the Smashing Magazine logo. When I was working on the, on the chapter for the book, I wanted a real life example of that would be a really good candidate for SVG, but at the same time, it wouldn't be a really good idea to use SVG for that. The Smashing Magazine logo is a perfect candidate for SVG, but because of all of the lighting effects and the shadows and all of these effects that you see in it, the file size in SVG was around 300 kilobytes. And after optimizing it, I was able not just optimizing it was not really enough to slash the file size down, so I had to remove some of the lighting effects and shadows and all of these things that they have in it. And even with that, I was only able to reduce the file size to 40 kilobytes. While the PNG version that they are serving currently only weighs 5.9 kilobytes. So if you have to choose between this format or that, keep in mind that performance is key. Uh, even if an image is a great candidate for SVG, don't choose SVG if it's going to affect the performance in a bad way. All right? Now, like I said, SVG is an image format and a document format. So it can do much more than just display images. You can use SVG. I'm going to get to this, this whole icon systems debate later in the talk, so I'm going to keep that for later. You can use it for icon systems, and you should. Uh, you can use it for creating ad banners, because Flash is practically dying. 
Uh, Firefox already blocks it. Chrome is going to be blocking it too. Uh, there was even, I think, someone from Facebook who once called you know, to kill Flash completely. So it has no future. In order to replace those ad banners that are made in, in Flash, HTML5 and SVG are a great way to do that. So again, I'm going to show an example of this later. SVGs are perfect for infographics. Infographics are usually illustrations that also contain text. And because of the nature of SVG, the text inside of an SVG image can be accessible, searchable, and selectable. So it's real text. And infographics is one of my favorite use cases for SVG. Data visualizations, you can also use Canvas and, and WebGL. And a lot of people, well, some of them use SVG and they have no issues with them. But I've also heard from other developers who have used SVG for data visualizations, but they said that the performance suffered a lot. Now, this is because the performance of SVG in general, especially on mobile devices, and especially when it comes to animation, uh, they're not hardware accelerated yet, so the performance may, might not be the best. Uh, in some cases, Canvas really does offer a much better performance alternative. So you have to choose, again, weigh your options and test the performance. The, uh, SVG is great for animated illustrations. Um, you see the, these a lot everywhere on the web. Uh, SVG also comes with a bunch of filter effects that you can use on SVG elements as well as HTML elements. And these effects can allow you to create some really, really nice UI elements and, um, and effects. Brenna, I think, is going to be talking about uh, creating text effects with SVG, so keep an eye on that. This is a very interesting area. And SVG is perfect also for creating UI shapes and arbitrarily shaped UI components. If you want to create a circular menu, SVG is awesome for that. Any kind of arbitrary shape, SVG is perfect for that. Now, even though I'm the huge SVG advocate that I am, and I always tell people to use SVG instead of CSS for creating shapes, because CSS shapes are fake. They're not real shapes. They're not semantic. Just don't do that. Uh, I sometimes do uh, cheat. Uh, an example of this is on a recent client project. This is not from the project, but this is just an example. These little triangles that we add to the UI, these are a great candidate for SVG because it's a triangle. And if you create it in, SV in CSS, you're not really creating a triangle. You're just making something look like a triangle. SVG is great for this, but uh, productivity-wise, it was a lot easier and faster for me to just use this technique instead of go and create the SVG image and then reference it in CSS. Right? So I'm pretty, pretty sure that everyone would probably prefer to do this. However, this excuse will no longer be an excuse in the future because um, Tab Atkins introduced a new specification uh, which defines at custom ad rules. I, I'm not really sure if he has already written it, but the idea is out there and uh, it's going to be um, written, the specification. So we have, we're going to have a custom at SVG rule, which will enable us to create simple SVG shapes inside of CSS. Now, this is going to be, you know, with Big power comes, comes big responsibility. So if you, when this happens, when we have this technique, make sure you don't really create complex SVGs in your CSS and always keep the separation of concerns and only use it sparingly for examples like that little triangle. Now, this add SVG rule here is part of the post CSS plugin. Uh, so you can use it today. You can experiment with it today if you want. Now, there's also a SAS mixin that you can check out, which enables you to create really simple effects like these in CSS and SAS today. OK, now, this is the main focus of my talk here. Usually, OK, so you're sold on SVG and you want to use SVG in your workflow. Uh, the process of implementing SVG and bringing SVG as part of your toolkit and using it in responsive web design workflow usually includes, is usually separated into a design phase and a development phase. The design phase is usually handled by the designer. You're going to love the developer meme more. <laughs> the design phase is usually handled by a designer who may or may not know how to code. Um, OK, I know that sometimes there are exceptions. That's why I said usually. Some, I know a lot of developers who do the design themselves. They draw stuff in Illustrator, export it, and animate it. I think Sarah Dresner is an example, among many others. Uh, but usually, if you're working in teams, and I'm saying this based on my own experience, I'm usually the developer who works with uh, design agencies. They have their own design a team of designers who create the design assets, and then they hand them over to me to implement, script, animate, whatever. So there's usually the design phase, where a designer creates all kinds of awesome stuff, adds all of these awesome effects to the SVG, and you know he designs, or he or she designs, the asset. On the other side, there's the developer. <laughs> we, we do look like that, right? <laughs> 
secretly, you know, when we're not trying to be like all cool and stuff. So there's the designer who, again, handles the design phase. And then there's the developer who's responsible for embedding, scripting, and animating the SVG image. OK. Because of the, I, I love to emphasize this, because of the nature of SVG as both an image format and a document format, every step taken in the design phase, every decision that the designer makes in the design phase when they're creating the SVG directly affects the resulting code which the developer has to deal with. And this is exactly why I chose this meme. Today there is a, like most of the designers, most of them, if not all of them that I've worked with knew very little, if anything, about SVG code. And so they create all of those images in, as in, in Illustrator or sometimes in InDesign or in Photoshop, and then they send, send them over to me. And this is usually my reaction when I see the code that's exported from, from those graphics editors. So what I have to do in that case, because based on some decisions, I'm going to be talking about those, based on those decisions, the, the SVG code can really suffer. You can, you can end up with bloated code, um, extremely large file sizes, um, elements that you cannot handle or animate the way that you would want to. So what I would always have to do is tell the designer to go over those designs once again and redesign them. And this is, I'm pretty sure this is how they look and this is how I look while I wait for them to redesign those images. The reason for that is because there is a knowledge gap. Designers know very little, most of them, again, if, uh, how many of you are designers here? Okay, uh, how many of you are familiar with SVG code? Oh, pretty, pretty cool. Well, the ones that I have worked with uh, knew very little about <laughs> SVG code. Uh, because of this knowledge gap, all of the decisions that they made affected the code in a bad way. There are some exceptions, of course. Now, I'm not saying designers need to know how to code, but a little, a little knowledge about you know, how they don't need to know, like, these elements that are generated or the path data or anything like that, it's sometimes just, su it suffices to just know that these decisions that they're making, okay, this decision is going to affect the code in a good way or in a bad way. Developers also need to know a little bit about the design process. Why? Because if a developer is going to tell a designer not to use that specific technique, it would really help if they can provide an alternative for that. I'm going to show examples. So, if there is a communication, if developers and designers communicate early in the design stage, this can save both teams a lot of time in the process. And believe me, especially if you're a team, um, if you're spread across the globe, uh, time differences, time zones, you send the, the SVG back to the designer. I used to send it, for example, in my morning, um, and I had to wait sometimes till the next morning to, to like, till I get the, the design back, the fixed design, because of the time differences. So a little knowledge on both sides can really help. And on the, in the long run, when this happens, when they communicate, when, the, when they learn from each other, at some point, a designer is going to learn that a developer can really be their best friend. And of course, it also works the other way around. And in case you're wondering, the cat's the designer here. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about a process today. Uh, there is a, a design process, which includes creating the SVGs and graphics editors. I'm, I'm going to be focusing on Illustrator because it's uh, most design teams usually use Illustrator, but the principles apply to pretty much any other graphics editor. There's also the development, embedding, scripting, spriting, and animating. And in between, there's the export, exporting, which includes optimizing the SVG and the tools that you can use to do that. So let's start with the design process. The tips that I'm going to mention here are targeted at designers. And if you're a developer that you're going to create your own SVGs, you can also benefit from these. Or if you're going to work with a designer who does not know about these things, make sure you let them know. Uh, I'm actually happy to say that with the next release of Illustrator, most of these tips are going to be obsolete. Um, Illustrator is going to get a lot better with exported SVG code. Um, this is really great news, but until that happens, and if you're using the current or any older versions, these tips can really help. Convert text to outlines or don't. Um, outline text is not, is not selectable, searchable, or accessible. When you turn text to outlines, you are, it's, not, it's not real text anymore. You have a few paths that create the shape of that text. So unlike real SVG text, they're not going to be selectable or searchable uh, by the user, and they're not going to be accessible to screen readers. Outline text will preserve the font. This is an advantage. It will preserve the font face you're using without needing a web font. 
This is usually good for letterings and logos. I don't usually recommend, even if you use an SVG to create a logo, I don't recommend using a web font for that. If the web font fails for any reason, and there are many reasons it could fail, especially with ad blockers and content blockers today, if they disable the font, your logo is not, you're going to lose your brand. Um, you know, the font face used is essential to the brand, right? So, and if you lose that, the logo is, well, it's probably, it's practically going to fail. So, Convert text to outlines and logos and letterings because it's going to preserve the font face without you having to worry about it failing. Outlining text, keep in mind that it can significantly incre increase file size depending on the font, font styles that you're using. Again, performance. And outline text is made up of paths, so it might not be as controllable or, or animatable as individual characters. The second tip is create simple shapes using simple shape elements instead of paths. If you have a circle, if you have an ellipse, Use circle, use, sh use an ellipse, don't use paths to create them. Simple shapes are easier to maintain, maintain and edit manually. Simple shapes are easier to animate because they come with a lot of attributes. For example, if you have a circle and you want to um, stretch it out into an ellipse, for example, you can simply change the R, the radius of it. Uh, if you want to change the position, change the CX and CY, which is the position of the, of the center. But if you have a path that makes up the circle, you're going to have to use transforms in order to do that. You're going to have to use transforms to translate it or skew it or whatever. That's not optimal, especially if you're going to have complex animations and one animation is going to interfere with the other, not fun. So this is an example here. You have a circle. It has attributes like fill, stroke, CX, CY, and R. And on the other hand, you have a path which has fill, stroke, and D. You don't know where the position of the center is. You don't know where uh, the width and the height of, uh, not the width and the height, the radius. It's not really that maintainable by hand. Simplify paths. This is crucial for performance. Each point is represented as a pair of coordinates in the path data. So if you have a path that is made up of a large number of points, this means that the data is going to be more, the file size is going to be a lot bigger, and hence it's going to affect the performance. You can do that by choosing object path, simplify paths, and illustrator. Or you can use the simplify algor algorithm that comes by default that I mentioned, or use the warp tool. Uh, designers know what it is. I have no idea what it is, but I know that you can use it to simplify paths as well. Uh, this example here shows that when you simplify the paths, you get to see the number of points before and after. And of course, that's going to affect the file size eventually. Combine paths where possible, but only if you don't need to animate the individual paths separately. One of the most popular websites for downloading icons is the Nound Project. And when I was working on, uh, on one of my workshop files a while back, a while back I downloaded a, a trash bin. It usually has the, the cover on the top and the body of it. And what I wanted to do, I just wanted to add a simple animation where you open the cover on hover. I couldn't do that because the designer that created the icon combined the paths. So instead of ending up with two elements that you can control separately, you had only one path and I couldn't animate them. So again, the designer needs to know what the developer wants to do with that image, with that icon, with whatever it is. And based on that, make the decisions in the design process. Simplify paths. Okay do that all the time. Combine paths, only do it if you know that you're not going to need them to be separated. Fit the artboard to drawing. This is one of the most useful tips. It allows you to crop the SVG and thus get rid of any extra white space around your drawing. Um, how many times, how many of you have ever exported an SVG, embedded it, sized it, but ended up with a size that was totally different from what you expected? Well, that's a lot. Because there's some extra white space usually if you create an SVG, if you don't crop it, if you don't fit the artboard to the drawing that you're, you're drawing, you're going to end up with white space, and that white space is going to be preserved. So if you specify 30 pixels by 30 pixels, the white space is going to count, and the actual content of the image is going to be smaller than that. Use good grouping, layering, and naming conventions. I think this is pretty much self-explanatory, but I've also suffered from this a lot. Um, I would get a drawing, I would get a drawing and illustration. I, I would spend a lot of time in Illustrator or in, in the dev tools usually, just hovering over the element that I want to animate, only so I know that, okay, this group is that element. This circle is the head of whatever that I'm working with. If the naming conventions, if good naming conventions are used, they don't have to be perfect. Uh, I once heard a designer tell me that, you know, developers don't usually like our naming conventions. They don't have to be special or specific, just simple, simple uh, tips such as, you know, if you have a head, call it head. If you had whatever, give, give them meaningful names. 
The layer and group names that you use in Illustrator will also be, trans will, will be translated to IDs in the SVG code. It makes scripting, styling, and editing code easier and much more time saving. And it's best for automated workflows that use file names and SVG generation. A lot of tools take the files that you've created and create other files based on those. For example, if you're spriting. So the naming conventions that you use for your SVGs are going to be used in the new generated files. So if you want to save yourself a lot of headaches and time, use good naming and layer, uh, grouping conventions. Number seven, this is also one of the most common, um, I'm not going to say mistakes, but one of the things that the designers really need to avoid is use SVG filters that are available in, in Illustrator, not the Photoshop effects. If you're going to create a drop shadow, one of the files that, uh, that was handed over to me was about 200 or 300 kilobytes in size. It was huge. If I wanted to edit one thing, I, I kept scrolling for like 20 minutes, 20 seconds till I got to the element that I wanted to, to control. In Illustrator today, that's going to change. If you create a drop shadow using, for example, um, the blur effect here, if you, use, if you use the blur effect that's under the Photoshop effects, Illustrator is going to save that as a bitmap image. And that's going to be embedded inside of the SVG or external, depending on how you choose to do it. But it's going to be a bitmap. It's not going to be an SVG blur effect. So in order to create a blur effect that's translated into SVG code, the way you would want it to, use the SVG filters and then use one of those filters. If you, if you have here um, AI Gaussian blur, use that instead. A lot of designers use Photoshop, and the good news is you can, Photoshop can natively export SVG. There used to be a lot of, um, the, the, there was this work around that you could do in order to export whatever you want from Photoshop as SVG, but you, don't, you no longer have to do that. Um, you can select the layers that you want to export, open the File Extract Assets window, and then select the layers and define which format you want to export them. And you have the choice between JPEG, PNG, and SVG. Uh, more about that in the link. Um, the slides, I'm going to share them later today. Export the SVG. When you export the SVG, you have two options, SVG compressed, SVGZ, or SVG. Choose SVG. Uh, again, the designer that I worked with, um, she thought that SVG compressed would give me a compressed SVG, thus a better SVG, but it's not editable, so don't do that. Use SVG instead. Export multiple SVG files using multiple artboards if and when needed. So you're working in Illustrator, you have multiple artboards. Uh, each artboard is for an icon, for example, if you're working with an icon system. Depending on, how you, depending on whether or not you check this use artboards here checkbox, you can either end up with one SVG file or multiple ones. Now, how do you know if you need one or multiple artboards? That depends on what you're going to do with the SVG and what spriting technique that you're going to choose. I'm going to be talking about that too. If you have multiple artboards and you choose to export them as using the use artboards option that we checked, you're going to end up with three different, I have three icons here, you're going to end up with three different SVG files. Okay, one file per icon. The other option, if you don't want to export multiple files, keep them into, in one artboard and export it. You're going to end up with one SVG file that has all of the icons inside of it. Now each of these is useful for one of the three different sprighting techniques we're going to go over next. Before we do that, exporting SVG for the web with Illustrator, this is going to change drastically in the next version of, uh, in the next version of Illustrator. But again, it's useful to know how it works today. The type of the SVG font that you choose, the first option, you can choose SVG or convert to outlines. Again, what we mentioned earlier, if you want to convert it to outlines, do it. If you don't want to, keep it as SVG. Uh, the image location, remember when I said that um, Blur effects, for example, or drop shadows are going to be exported and saved as bitmap images. That's going to happen anyway if you don't use SVG filters. But choosing the embed or link, if you choose embed, the image is going to be embedded inside of the SVG. You save an extra HTTP request. Or if you choose link, you're going to end up with an external bitmap, and you probably don't want that anyway. Uh, the CSS properties allows you to specify where you want the styles to be. You want them inside of the style tag, inside of a style tag inside the SVG, or you want them to be inline or use presentation attributes. And the decimal places, choose one. Whenever you can, choose one. The less the number of decimal places, the smaller the file size is going to be and the better it is for performance. Always keep the width and the height attributes on the SVG. Um, 
when I first started working with SVG and started giving talks about SVG, and when I talked about how to make SVGs responsive with CSS, the first thing that I would always mention is to get rid of the width on the height attributes. Uh, that is no longer true. Um, it makes sense to get rid of them because you don't want your SVG to be fixed, right? You want it to be fluid. And in order to do that, you would have to, well, not have width, uh, uh, fixed width and height attributes. But uh, as it turns out, Keeping the width and the height attributes allows you to, to avoid other problems that are more important than you know, making it fluid. First of all, if you want to make it fluid and you keep the width and the height attributes, it's very easy. Just go over to your CSS, specify width and height to be 100%. The CSS is going to override these attributes, and you've got yourself a fluid SVG. The width, the, the width and the height attributes are, going, are still going to be there, and that's going to be useful, one for Fallback, if the CSS fails to load for any reason, instead of stretching out, um, that used to happen with CodePen long ago. Um, if the CSS, I'm, I have a very slow connection back home. I'm by very, very slow, I mean really slow. Uh, so it, it usually took a couple of seconds for the, for the style sheet to load. And before it did, the CodePen logo would, talk, would take the entire space on, on, on the page. That didn't look too good. So in order to, to avoid that, keep the width and the height attributes. And the more important thing is, if you're going to use the SVG as a background image in CSS, there's going to be scaling problems in Illustrator, uh, in Internet Explorer, duh, and in some other browsers if the width and the height are not specified. If you want the SVG to work as expected in a background image, keep the width and the height attributes. So again, at the end of the section, in order to fill that gap, there needs to be communication between designers and developers. If you want to save yourself a lot of time, a lot of headaches, make sure designers and developers sit together, talk together early in the process so that designers know what to do and what to avoid when creating the SVGs. Communication is key and is love. Okay. That felt like an hour. <laughs> Optimize the SVG. Um, no matter how much you do in the, in the editor, you're probably almost always going to need to optimize the SVG using a standalone optimization tool because there is currently a lot of junk exported from editors. Um, again, Illustrator is going to get a lot better. All of that junk that we see at the beginning of the SVG is not going to be there anymore. Um, and a lot of other changes are coming. But if you're using Sketch, for example, Sketch is the worst when it comes to exported SVG code because it has no options, that at least none that I know of, that enable you to choose how to optimize it and how to clean the code up. Um, Inkscape has better options. We're going to get to those later. So if you're going to optimize the SVG, there are a lot of tools out there, but the one that is the most popular one, the most powerful one, is SVGO. Uh, it's a Node.js based tool. Uh, it allows you to well, obviously, optimize the SVG. It comes with a, set of all, with a set of tools that you can implement and use in practically any workflow. There is a Grunt plugin, a Gulp plugin. Uh, there's even an Illustrator plugin. All you have to do is plug it into Illustrator, and then you get to optimize the SVG before you export it. So, so it adds to the ex export options of Illustrator. There's an OSX folder action. Again, there's a drag and drop GUI. I use that a lot for very simple icons. Um, all I have to do is... All you have to do is just drag and drop your icons into the GUI, and they're going to be replaced. Keep this in mind. They're going to be replaced with the optimized version. And all of these tools, there is one really bad thing about them. SVGO can change the document structure. It can break your SVG, literally break it, um, be it SVG or any other optimization tool. But because of all of the optimizations that are done, some of them change ID, some of them change structure, which practically like happens almost always, it can break your SVGs. And there is no way to tell if the SVG is going to be broken after you optimize it or not. This is why I never use any of those tools except the drag and drop GUI. If I know that the icon, for example, a Twitter icon, it's just one path. Uh, it's going to be optimized. Structure is not going to be affected. I use that. But uh, because there is no GUI, Jake Archibald created this SVG OMG tool, which gives you that, exactly that, a GUI. All you have to do, uh, it, by the way, it works, works offline, which is, ama which is amazing, really. Um, all you have to do is upload your SVG, 
no matter what it is, and choose the optimizations that you want to apply. Check whichever one you want and uncheck the ones that you don't want that are going to break the SVG. And once you're happy with the result, download it and use it. Optimizing the SVG is really important. It can slash your file size down by more than a half. Seriously. Um, if you want to learn all about those tools, there's also, uh, I think someone added an Inkscape plugin a while back. Uh, all of them are available in this blog post here. You don't always need or want to optimize the SVG. Inkscape is a great example of clean code generated from you know, a graphics editor. That didn't make a lot of sense. Inkscape comes with a lot of options that are already available and um, present in SVGO. And when I use these options, when you choose to save SVG, choose the optimized SVG option. Not the regular SVG option, the optimized SVG. You get all of these checkboxes here that enable you to choose a lot of stuff. Like if you want to convert CSS attributes to CSS attributes to XML attributes, uh, collapse groups or not, uh, embed rasters or not, remove comments, metadata, enable view boxing, always do that. Never disable it. Never remove the view box. Uh, remove the XML declaration, a lot of stuff. And the code that is exported from Inkscape is most of the times very clean. So if you're going to animate the SVG, you're not going to have a problem with it. But remember, optimization breaks structure. If you have an SVG that you've created in Illustrator, for example, or whatever graphics editor, you create a certain grouping, uh, layering, naming conventions, and you know that you're going to use those when you script the SVG. If you optimize it using SVGO, you're going to lose most of that. So currently, the best thing that I would recommend before Illustrator gets better. Um, I would personally use Inkscape, even though I really hate it. Uh, I would use it to create the SVG the way I wanted to and export it and end up with clean code that I wouldn't have to optimize. Development. I'm going to give you a few seconds break. You know. So how many of you are developers? The majority of yours. OK. Um, how many of you already use um, SVG, for example, icon systems? Great. Um, how many of you are, are familiar with all of the sprighting techniques? No, that's actually good. <laughs> OK. The first, there are three main sprighting techniques for SVG. They're, they're each different, each has its pros and cons, and one of them is very, very similar to the icon fonts, so you're going to see how similar, just how similar it is. The first one and the most popular one is when you export the SVG, when you export multiple artboards, the one that we mentioned earlier, this is usually the sprighting technique that you would use with them. You would have multiple SVG files. Uh, there are tools that will help you create the SVG sprite from those images. From, you would have a folder, for example, that contains all of your icons, one file per icon. And then there's the uh, SVG, SVG store. Uh, I don't really remember the name. Um, basically, it combines all of your icons into one SVG file. If you use Icomoon to choose your icons from Icomoon, it's going to create that SVG sprite for you. Uh, each icon inside of the sprite is going to be wrapped in a symbol element. The symbol element is used to group element together, elements together while also not displaying them. So whatever goes into the symbol is not going to be directly displayed on the page. So you have one SVG file that contains multiple symbols, one symbol for each icon. And then all you have to do, each symbol has its own ID. And then, OK, before I get to how to embed them, um, SVGs are accessible, and you need to make sure that they, they're accessible and you can make them, how do I phrase that? It comes with two accessibility elements, the title and the description. Every group in SVG can have a title and a description of its own. So if you have a symbol, for example, and you add the title and the description inside of it, and then you reuse that symbol anywhere on the page where you want to display the icon, the title and the description are going to be copied with it. So the icon is going to have its own title and description, and it's going to be accessible, accessible to screen readers. So always make sure that you make them as accessible as possible. Now, so you have your set of symbols, and then you want to reuse them, display them on the page. You do that using the use element. Using the use, you use xlink href to reference the icon that you want, and it's going to be displayed on the page. Now, ideally, we would be able to do the second option at the bottom, where you would have uh, the sprite be external, 
and then you reference fragments inside of it using a fragment identifier. Uh, this didn't work in, in, in Internet Explorer before, which uh, was a problem, but there was a, the SVG for everybody. Um, it's a polyfill which enables you to use this technique and provides um, you know, fallback for, uh, for IE8 for IE, any version of IE actually. Um, Microsoft Edge currently does support this, so if, depending on the browser support that you're after, you may or may not need to use uh, that polyfill. Now, okay, so you have your set of icons, you use them wherever you want on the page, but there's usually one problem with this. This approach, styling the contents of the use is not really straightforward. Um, the reason for that is when you use a symbol, the contents of that symbol are copied, are cloned into a shadow DOM. And you cannot access the contents of that symbol using CSS selectors like you would with HTML or any other, uh, if the SVG were in line, for example. You, you won't be able to do that. So how would you style them? Suppose you have an image. I have this robot here. The original one is the one on the right, and the themed versions are the second and the third. If you have an icon or an image, you, not a lot of people tend to theme their icons, but if you have an image that you're using, reusing in multiple pages, or a logo, for example, and you want to theme it, change the colors, change the theme, how do you do that if you cannot select the contents of the use? How many of you know how? Well, there is currently only one approach that makes this fairly easy, and it's actually really powerful, but that approach requires the use of CSS variables. So the way you would do it is, if you want to display multiple robots, robots, and each one has its own theme, first of all, use them, put them in the page wherever you want them to, and give each one its own ID. And then, actually you have to start here before you go there, so I'm gonna start here. The contents of the symbol, which define the, the, the robot, instead of using just, just the fill colors like you would normally do, and then you wouldn't be able to, to, to change them using CSS, you can use CSS variables. CSS variables are used to inject styles, styles into, the, into the shadow DOM by, they are practically leaking the styles into it. How does that work? So if you have, for example, a fill color, a path that has a certain fill color, what we're doing here is we have a fill attribute and we have a style, a style attribute. Inside of the style attribute, we have a fill property that uses CSS variables. And the CSS variable, the function, defines the variable itself and a color, which is the same as the color as the fill attribute. So what does this mean? First of all, the fill attribute is there as a fallback. If a browser does not support CSS variables for any reason, it's going to fall back to the fill attribute. Always make sure you keep that. Just like with the width and the height attributes, keep them for fallback. Now inside of the style, this is CSS. A CSS property is always going to override the presentation attribute. That's a given. Now, inside of the variable function, you have the variable name and you have the color. The color here is the fallback that is going to be used by the browser, browser that does support CSS variables, but if you, for any reason, provide a color value that's invalid, that browser is going to use that fallback. So the fill, the fill attribute and the color inside of the, inside of the variable function are both fallbacks. And what we're going to use to theme the SVG is the, is the variable. So you place the variable wherever you want inside of the SVG. Um, for example, if you have three colors, three main colors, and you want to change those uh, to, to create a different theme, place the variables inside of the SVG this way, the way you would, where you would want them to be. And then in the CSS, for each robot, specify the values for those colors. This way, wherever you define, no matter how many uh, copies of that image that you have you want to use, you can theme them and change the color simply by changing and by spe defining the color names inside of your CSS. This is how you would leak styles into the shadow DOM. Uh, CSS variables are currently only supported in Firefox. Uh, they are uh, on the backlog for MS Edge, so support is going to get better in the future, hopefully. Uh, I know that I didn't cover much, and there's some things, we, we already have two variables in CSS today, which is the current color, no, that's just one variable. So we can do some styling today without CSS variables. You can learn all about that in excruciating detail in this article that I wrote for Code Drops. <clears throat> now, that technique with CSS variables only works if the SVG sprite is in, in line. What if the SVG sprite is external? That poses another problem because 
well, you won't be able to do that anymore if it's external. How are you going to inject the, the variable or give the value, variable a value if this SVG is external and you can't access it? I'm not making much sense to myself right now, so I'm not real sure if I'm making sense to you. Anyway, the idea is if the SVG sprite is not in line, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. So Tab Atkins, again, another excellent specification. It defines what's called, what called SVG parameters. Uh, they are a way to set CSS custom properties, aka variables, on external SVG image by passing them through a special fragment scheme on the URL. So instead of putting the variable inside of the SVG, for example, you would put it inside of the uh, URL like this. You would define it in the URL like this. Okay, so it gives a subset of the customizability that inline SVG images have to external SVG images. Again, this technique is the most popular one because it's inline, it has more power when it comes to animating the SVG, but it has its limitations and hopefully it's gonna change in the future. The second sprighting technique is more of a visual one. It's very similar, uh, it uses uh, SVG fragment ident identifiers. It's a visual approach uh, similar, very similar to, to, a sprite, uh, to, an SV, to a PNG sprite. With a PNG sprite, you would have one image that contains all of the icons. And then if you want to position them inside as a background image usually in CSS, you would choose the background area and background size so that only one of those icons is visible in the background positioning area, right? This is very similar. But instead of using background position and background size, you use what is called a view. So it uses one sprite that contains all of the icons, but instead of looking at it from a code perspective, you look, you look at it from a visual perspective. It uses the position and the bounding box of an icon inside of the sprite to create a view for that icon, and then you display each icon by referencing its view. How does it work? Okay, first of all, this is the sprite. These are the icons inside of it. To create a view, which is basically just this rec rectangle that surrounds the icon. If you want to display the, uh, the GitHub icon, for example, you need that bounding rectangle around, of it, around it. So in order to get that, you need the position of that rectangle and the dimensions. Uh, you can do that visually. If you're using Illustrator and you use the transform panel, the X, Y, and the width and the height values are the values of the bounding box of the icon. But, uh, but um, you need to make sure that uh, here, that the uh, transform origin is on the tap, top left corner of the SVG. Okay, if you're using Sketch, which is a little clear uh, UI-wise, the position is there, the size is there, use those values. Now, how do you use them? How do you create a view and then use it to embed the SVG? If you have an image, if you're going to embed the icon using an image tag, for example, all you have to do is reference the UI icons.svg, which is the sprite, a fragment identifier, how do you identify that view? Use the SVG view function. Inside of it, you use the view box function, and the value for the view box function is the position and the width and height of the, um, of the bounding box. Now, you need to be very comfortable working with the SVG view box. I definitely recommend doing that. If you're not comfortable with it, do get. Uh, it's, I always call it SVG superpowers. It can take your SVG knowledge to the next level. If you're not familiar with it, do make sure you are. Uh, I think Brenda is going to give a talk today about, uh, I think it's the second session, where, where she's gonna talk about um, SVG code, including the view box. So if you're interested, make sure you don't miss that. Another way is, if you don't want, if you don't want to use the SVG view function to reference that view, you can create a view inside of the SVG file each view would have an ID and the view box, and then you reference that in the, in the, in the, in the HTML like uh, using just the fragment identifier, which is the ID of that view. I, I personally prefer this, and this is the less buggy of, uh, of both. Uh, support for this one is a lot better. There are problems if you're using the SVG as background image, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. And remember to specify the width and the height for the image refer referencing the SVG views, otherwise you're gonna have problems. Now the third sprighting technique is very, very similar to icon fonts. Just like with icon fonts, you use the icon as a background image in CSS. It goes inside of the CSS. It's the closest you can get to icon fonts using SVG. Supports back to IE6, so all of these icon fonts have IE6 support. That's no longer an excuse. Uh, it has the same animation capabilities as icon fonts. You can change the color and hover. Uh, plus the advantages of SVG, they look crisp, they're awesome, they're SVG. And there are tools to automate and speed up the, the sprouting process for you. 
Uh, the tool of my uh, choice is Grunt Icon or the Grump Icon. Grump Icon is the UI, the GUI for Grunt Icon. Grunt Icon is the plugin. So what you do is you have your folder that contains your icons. All you have to do is just drag and drop into the GUI, and it's going to generate everything for you. All you have to do is just place a script inside of your page, and your CSS files, put them somewhere, wherever you want, and it's going to take care of everything for you. And then all you have to do, just like with icon fonts, you would have a span, for example, and you would provide the icon as a background image for that span. It doesn't get any more similar to icon fonts. Now, the script, uh, it takes care of loading the appropriate version for the different browser. How does it work? It, the, the Grump icon is going to provide you with the SVG, different SVG versions for different browsers, and it's going to also generate the PNGs for IE8 and below. And there's also an option where it embeds the PNG as a base64 embedded, but that doesn't work in IE7, so it's going to provide the fallback for you. It does everything for you. And the script is optimized for performance because um, this was created by the Filament Group, and they are really well known for how performance aware they are. So all you have to do, dump your icons into the, into the editor. It generates everything for you. Put the code where you want it to be, and it doesn't get any easier. Support back to IE6. Uh, an overview of all of the three spriting techniques can be found in this article here. OK, and why would I want to use SVG over icon fonts? This is a very controversial topic. And I tend to have a lot of um, debates on Twitter with people about this. But seriously, uh, Chris Coyer wrote an article. Uh, it's my go-to reference. If anyone, uh, sometimes I get tweets from, uh, from friends who ask me, like, th th they're preparing for a battle where they need to fight for SVG and prove that SVG is better. So I always link them to that article by Chris. Uh, but some of the advantages of SVGs are, and they're infinitely scalable, they look crisp on all resolutions, icon fonts don't. Uh, they're stylable via CSS, you can have multi-colors, icon fonts can't. There's this uh, stacking technique uh, that is used to do that, but it's too hacky and too much work to create a multi-color icon. Easier size control, they're interactive and immutable using CSS, Smell, or JavaScript. Don't use Smell, I'm going to get to that next. Uh, they have semantic markup. An icon is an image. The shapes inside of that icon are all semantic. They are fully accessible, including the text inside of them. Icon fonts are not. Many tools are available to make the creation, interaction, embedding, and spriting easier. So SVG is superior. Now, there is one. there are different embedding and fallback techniques. There is one thing that a while back, when we were having that conversation on Twitter, one of my followers said, that he still uses, uh, he had this project, this icon project, and he said that when he created the icon system using icon fonts, and he created the same icon system using SVG, the file size of the SVG watch was much larger than that of the font, and for that reason he, cho cho he said that sometimes icon fonts can be better. Well, it's true that sometimes it can be better, but the, you should emphasize this sometimes, because that's not always true. Someone, again, one of my followers, um, he switched from icon fonts to SVG, and this is what he tweeted. He moved from icon fonts the, to SVG sprite. He saved 7.2% in the CSS and 51.6% in the file size. So that whole um, SVG is heavier than icon fonts is not always true. Another thing is icon fonts have other problems. Um, Opera, Mini, it. We don't download icon fonts. Icon, icon font, icons are what SVG is for. So Opera Mini just does not download your icon fonts. Um, the Bruce Lawson said this. He works for Opera, so he knows. And another thing is ad blockers, content blockers. If your user is going to block your fonts, he's going to block your icons. You're going to end up with those little rectangles. And even if I'm not using any ad blocker, on my slow connection back home, I always see those little icons. And they are so incredibly infuriating. I feel very strongly about this, believe me. If you still need convincing, this is the cage match that uh, Chris wrote. It contains all of the details for all the, this, uh, the stuff that I mentioned before. Um, if you want to make the switch, if you are convinced and you want to make a switch, someone created this tool that helps you extract SVG icons from your icon fonts, no matter what icon font you're using. So you can use this, and you really have, like, there is no more excuse to not use SVG today. Animating SVG. I'm not going to be talking about animation because Sarah Dresner is going to be doing that, so don't miss that. Uh, but one of the most frequently questions that I get 
uh, how do I animate it, what tool do I use, what's the difference, etc. Uh, don't use Smell. Very simple. It uh, doesn't work in IE, never, probably never will because there are no plans to, uh, of implementing it in Edge. Um, it's also being deprecated in Chrome. Uh, use CSS only for simple animations because it has too many problems. I'm going to show you a couple next. Uh, so uh, also support socks. Uh, all the versions of IE, IE not, even, I, even those that do support SVG, they didn't support animations on SVG elements. So support their socks. Uh, transformations on SVG elements still don't work in MS Edge when it comes to CSS. So again, support socks. Uh, use JavaScript for all kinds of complex animations. Again, Sarah's going to get into the details of that, so I'm not going to do that. But if you are creating any kind of complex animation for your SVG, I recommend using JavaScript. Now, there are some popular SVG JavaScript animation libraries. The number one is GreenSock, uh, GSAP, aka GSAP. It's the GreenSock animation platform. It is the, the most powerful of all platforms. The amount of power and control and possibilities and seriously, I cannot, like, ugh. it's the best. <laughs> Snap SVG is also amazing. It was created by Dmitry Baranovsky, who, uh, who created, um, what is it called? What was it called? The old, uh, most, the, the previous most popular animation library. Yeah, exactly. So, I use Snap SVG as uh, to manipulate SVG DOM, not to animate it. It's it's also known as the jQuery of SVG. So everything, all of the easy that you get if you work with jQuery, for example, uh, with the HTML DOM, uh, Snap SVG can make manipulating SVG elements just as easy. There's also Velocity.js. I've never used it myself, but I hear it's good. And D3.js, which is mostly used by anyone who's doing any kind of data visualizations with SVG. Now, some of the problems that CSS introduces if you're going to animate SVGs with CSS, one of them is the transform origin problem. Um, most of the times, if you're going to transform an SVG and you want to rotate an element around itself, you would specify it, you, you would tell it that the transform origin has to be at 50% by 50%, which is the center of the element. That is a lot easier than using, you know, getting the pixel value of, of that point. Just tell the browser, I want it to be at 50%, 50%. But this was very problematic until recently, and it still actually is. Chrome behaves as expected. Uh, the purple here is an HTML rectangle. The green is an SVG rectangle. And we're rotating both elements around the center, which is 50% by 50%. In Chrome, it works as expected. IE and Opera, they don't honor transformations at all. Uh, Firefox used to have a problem. This has been fixed in the latest version of Firefox, but it was worth mentioning anyway. Um, it didn't support percentage transform origins on SVGs. So even if you told it that you want it to be at 50%, 50%, it would still use the default transform origin, which is the top left corner of the SVG. You don't want that. But Thankfully, it's been solved today. Uh, Safari has a problem in that if you zoom the page, uh, the transform origin is going to be messed up. So CSS has a lot of problems. Uh, another problem is it's not CSS, it's SVG. It's just the way SVG works here. Um, if you have multiple transformations applied to an element and you're changing the transform origin for each of those transformations halfway along you know, in the animation, the right side is how the default SVG behavior is. Whenever you change the transform origin, the browser is going to jump back to the initial position, change it, and then animate it. That's not how you would want it to behave. Uh, on the left side is the animation, that, the effect that you get if you use GreenSock. It gives you all the power, everything you expect from SVG or from an animation, you get it with GreenSock. So my go-to animation library is GreenSock, and you can read all about those uh, problems and more in this article here. Which embedding technique should you choose? There are s seven ways to embed an SVG. One of them is the embed tag, but nobody, uh, none that I know of use, uses it anymore. Image, background image, object, iframe, inline SVG, or using a picture. Picture is very similar to image, except that it comes with a default fallback mechanism. So which one should you choose? How do you choose the technique that you need? Uh, filter your options down, set priorities, and compromises when needed. Is the SVG animated? If it's animated, if it's not animated, you can simply use an image tag or a background image or a picture. You don't need it to be animated, no problem at all. You can choose any technique. Is it interactive? Does it need, if you, does it need to change color or do some animation on hover or click? If it does, 
then image, background image, and picture are no longer an option because interactions don't work on those. Uh, what kind of animation? Does it require JavaScript? If it requires JavaScript, image, background image, and picture are no longer an option because JavaScript animations don't work with those. So you're left with object, iframe, and inline SVG. What browser support do you need? If you can animate it using CSS, do you need to support IE? Because if you do, you might not be able to do that because of all the bugs that we mentioned earlier. What kind of content and fallback do you need? For example, um, if you're using an image tag and you want to provide a fallback, you're going to provide it as an image tag. You know? But if you have, an, for, for example, if you're working with an infographic, usually the best kind of fallback to provide for infographics is the text that is inside of the graphic. Provide that as fallback, as a table of data, for example. And if you're going to do that, the object is your best option. Uh, this is a table that can help you filter your options down. Embedding technique, animations, which works and which doesn't work, and whether interactions work or not. You can also, you need to also keep in mind that this, uh, the location of the animations. If you're going to use CSS to animate it, sometimes it has, the animations have to be defined inside of the SVG. Again, this depends on the embedding technique. And why do I love object? If I had, I was once asked, asked at, uh, at a conference, if I had to choose only one SVG embedding technique, which one would it be? I said it would be object. Um, object is the most flexible of all, the most, I wouldn't say the most powerful, but it gives you the most amount of options. It enables modularity of content without sacrificing uh, the usability of styles and animations. Um, it's scriptable, animatable, interactive, everything you would want, you can do it. Cacheable resource. If the SVG you're referencing, uh, it can be, it's going to be cached. Uh, it comes with a default fallback mechanism, and the fallback can be text or image or even both. And all of the benefits of using SVG, accessible content, searchable, selectable, interactive shapes, everything. And it's actually perfect for ad banners. Uh, the banner content, including the scripts and animations, are encapsulated and easily reusable. So all you have to do is uh, plug the object and put it wherever you want on any page. All you have to do is move it there and the styles and interactions and everything are going to be encapsulated inside of it. It also gives you the separation of concerns that you don't get with the SVG that is embedded in line, for example. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, SVG and HTML5 animations are perfect, uh, are perfect alternative for flash animations. So, and you can read more about them in a case study that Chris Gannon wrote. He created an ad banner for uh, one of his clients he faced a lot of problems, uh, shows you the solution for them, and why SVG is great for creating SVG-only banners. Um, another example is infographics, as I mentioned again. The infographic is animated and can be interactive if you use object, and the best kind of fallback is the actual text. You put it between the opening and closing object tags, and you've got yourself the best kind of fallback for an infographic. Um, this is the end of it. Uh, credits, the geometric background that I've used is by Freepik, uh, the green sock, uh, screenshots are from Greensock and thank you very much for listening.